Welcome back. This is CFN's weekly news roundup. Laudator Jesus Christus. Praised be Jesus Christ. My name is Matt Gaspers. I'm CFN Catholic Family News Managing Editor, and I'm joined as always by my friend and colleague, Dr. Brian McCall, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Catholic Family News. Hello, Brian. It feels like it's been a really long time, but it's only been a couple weeks since we last spoke, so I hope you've been doing well. Yes, doing well. Had a, a nice Thanksgiving holiday and a happy Feast of St. Nicholas to you. Yes, same to you as well. Uh, today is a, a lot of different things. It's uh, the first Friday of the month. It's the Feast of, of St. Nicholas, a great feast for our times. As I mentioned during our last show, you know, according to tradition, he attended the Council of Nicaea as a, an elderly man and was kind of docile for a lot of it. But when he heard the, the heresies being spouted by Arius, the, the arch heretic, he actually got up from his seat, according to tradition, and either yanked on his beard or slapped him across the face or something like that to get him to be quiet. <laughs> so I, I don't know if he was accompanying him or just engaging in dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I think if I recall, he got the, not necessarily because he was opposing the heresy, but because the, his confreres thought that he was a little out of line and how he expressed himself he was thrown into a prison cell or something but then was miraculously released by angels something to that effect so god showing no this is actually pleasing to me because yes uh, i know there's a famous quote i forget who said it but uh, there is no sanctity where there is no hatred of heresy something like that something mm. to that effect. There, where there's no hatred of sin there's no sanctity Yes. So we ask for uh, St. Nicholas's intercession for us and our families uh, at this, as we continue enduring this, this crisis in the church. So let me see here. Uh, something else I wanted to mention before we jump into our first news story today. Um, today is also that uh, day of fasting, prayer, and reparation, which we told folks about uh, I think during our last broadcast a couple weeks ago. So just to briefly recap that, um, in early, well, I guess no, it was November 11th that the story broke on National Catholic Register. The four anonymous exorcists have urged all of the faithful throughout the world to engage in fasting, prayer, and reparation on December 6th, specifically to make reparation for the, the Pachamama outrage, the idolatry that went on during the, uh, the recent Amazon Synod, and just to combat the, the spirit, you know, the uh, principalities and powers, as, as Ephesians 6 says, the rulers of the world of this darkness who are clearly wreaking havoc and kind of having a heyday in the church. So they ultimately said in their statement, quote, we are therefore encouraging all Catholics who recognize the evil of the events to join us in a day of prayer and penance on December 6th for the purpose of driving out any diabolic influence within the church that has been gained as a result of these recent events, along with any other events. So this is a very serious, very important appeal. Unfortunately, I, I've even seen today on or I guess yesterday it was on social media, people kind of poo-pooing this. Uh, not surprisingly, they're also rabid supporters of Pope Francis. <laughs> so I think it's pretty obvious why they have that attitude. But for faithful Catholics, this is a very a serious call to arms, spiritual arms. So the, the things that the, the uh, exorcists recommend is to pray the rosary, take on some form of penance, such as fasting or perhaps abstinence, other forms of mortification, offer prayers to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which they provide in the article itself, and then any other, um, any other acts, maybe going to make a, a holy hour and, uh, with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, attending Mass, and other maybe such. Maybe praying the prayer to St. Michael, we might add. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right. All right. So I think we'll go ahead and jump into our first story today, which is certainly um, uh, in continuity, you might say, with the theme of making reparation, because it's again dealing with really some pandemonium in the true sense of that word, you know, <laughs> yes. going, continuing to go on in the, the nation of Chile. 
Um, as you alerted me the other day, there was a, a story that our friends at Rorate Chaley blog uh, reprinted. The original article is at, uh, should be displayed on the screen now from an outlet called The New American. And the headline reads, Chilean Conference of Bishops sides with Marxist protesters. <laughs> And you, as you can see for yourself, I did read that correctly. You heard correctly. This story came out on November 23rd, and there's a picture now displayed on a screen of a, a fire burning, uh, just a pile of probably uh, stuff that was inside of the church that was drug out and set on fire. So I'll just go ahead and read a little bit of this article, and we can provide commentary as we go. Uh, it says... Chile's Conference of Bishops have echoed the calls of protesters for a new Chilean constitution as protesters ransack, loot, burn, and desecrate Catholic churches throughout the country. <clears throat> as our viewers may recall, in mid-November, a few weeks back, we reported, I think during our November 15th edition of our weekly news roundup, a story that uh, broke through actually the Vatican News Service that said, uh, initially it said bishops of Chile condemn violence and the looting of churches. So apparently they're now changing their tune and starting to sympathize with the, the looters, unfortunately. And just to be clear, as I mentioned, you know, the pandemonium in the true sense of that word, if you watch our November 15th show, we displayed a picture of church doors that literally had spray painted on them an upside down cross with 666. So we are dealing with demonic activity here. Uh, this is, go ahead. As St. As St. Thomas would say, you know, not only obviously is looting and stealing uh, and vandalism a crime, but when it's committed against a church, it's a second crime of sacrilege. Correct. It's even more serious. So as you can hear, the bishops, rather than doing what I would think any bishop of prior century would do is condemn and probably declare excommunicated. Exactly. Hating these acts. They're now saying, oh, well, actually, you're not bad people. We're on the same side as you. And I, what Close I like. About, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What I like about this article from the, the New American is it really gets to the heart of the reason why these Chilean Catholic prelates are sympathizing with the, the looters, with the, the rioters in the streets. So further down in the article, it says, one might expect the Catholic population of Chile to mobilize to the defense of the symbols of their history and faith, to defend their places of worship, and to prevent additional sacrileges from taking place. Unfortunately, this hasn't been the case. Why? And then the author of this article provides the, the answer. The explanation is simple, he says. The Catholic Church in Chile and elsewhere throughout Latin America is heavily infiltrated with adherents of liberation theology. That's the crux of the matter. Who preach the gospel of Marx as opposed to the gospel of Christ. And we know now from testimony from uh, such men as uh, Lieutenant General Ian Mahai Pachepa, who is, uh, was the highest ranking intelligence officer in communist Romania, he defected to the U.S. in 1978 and has since wrote extensively about his inside information. We know from him and from other sources in the former Soviet Union that liberation theology was actually concocted by the KGB and, and um, imported, brought into Latin America in order to subvert the church and to make those countries red, essentially. Mm. And interestingly, uh, a certain Jorge Mario Bergoglio was the <laughs> was from Argentina. The Archbishop of Buenos Aires is very sympathetic to liberation theology because he was heavily influenced by communism, Marxism in his youth. We know that from his own testimony. George Neumeyer does a great job of summarizing that information in his book, The Political Pope, which we have reviewed for CFN in the past, and my uh, review of that book is available on our website. So the other, the other takeaway, I think, from this story, what comes to mind is that it's the errors of Russia are alive and well, and here's, here's the evidence. Our Lady, and so there's the Fatima connection. Mm -hmm. Our Lady told the three children at Fatima, <laughs> you know, if my requests are heeded, 
Uh, many souls will be saved in the world. There will be peace, but if not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church and of the Holy Father. She goes on to talk about uh, the good will be martyred, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of these catastrophes. So we, can see, we continue to see uh, the, the errors of Russia spreading throughout the world, and Latin America has been affected perhaps more than anywhere else aside I, I suppose china would probably be the primary example mm. of, of the errors of russia but people often forget that latin america has been devastated by the errors of russia so very so and and really more i mean china obviously communism has taken over the country but there were already <laughs> a number of catholics and most of them remained faithful you know weren't were infiltrated were not infiltrated um, until recently the Vatican capitulated and uh, did a deal with the communists. But yes. Latin America is the opposite. I mean, Latin America was staunchly Catholic. Yes. You know, has, has seen the persecution of the church. I mean, China, obviously, the underground church was persecuted physically. But really, in Latin America, it's been the mystical body of Christ persecuted spiritually, where the, the church has just been decimated. Absolutely right. And the and Soviets then, were, they, they weren't stupid. They knew that they had to use religion to their advantage. They knew that they couldn't outright stamp it out because the faith was so strong there. So they had to, uh, you know, give a, a Catholic veneer to what is simply outright communism. Yes. And, and hence that's where we got this liberation theology, which is a, continues to be a scourge for the church today. Yes. Well, moving, uh, I guess, up to North America, our next story uh, concerns uh, more more events in the, uh, the the crisis in the church, and we turn here to the diocese of Buffalo, New York, uh, which which we uh, we just wanted to mention that was the home diocese of yes. our dear friend and predecessor John Venari. That, exactly where his, his his requiem mass was actually celebrated in in, in Buffalo. Um, so interesting, you know, a personal connection for us at CFN. Um, but it was announced this week that uh, Bishop Richard Malone. Uh, has finally resigned. Uh, the Pope accepted his resignation. Uh, he, Malone, was in Rome in October for his ad limina visit. We mentioned those in our, our last um, newscast, actually, that bishops uh, have to go to Rome to report on the diocese. And, and really, the diocese of Buffalo has just been shaken uh, tremendously for at least the past year by uh, accusations uh, that Bishop Malone uh, was seriously involved in covering up sexual harassment and abuse of minors. Um, his secretary uh, has, uh, we'll talk about uh, that just a little bit later, but his secretary has uh, really been one of the people that released a lot of his information and acted kind of as a whistleblower. Uh, there's even recordings, uh, audio recordings of the bishop essentially admitting that he knew what was going on and if this ever got out, he'd be forced to resign. Um, notwithstanding that, for a year, he denied any wrongdoing. Um, and again, this, this is so harmful to the church because there are um, legitimate cases of clerics who are, are accused falsely, and they should deny and they vehemently deny it. But the problem is when you have people like this uh, who deny it when they, you know, privately admit they know they're guilty, it, it not only is it scandalous in of itself, but it harms these good priests, priests that you know, are right in saying I haven't done anything wrong, but it it understandably caused everyone to say, I don't really believe you. Because look at all these other people that for years denied they did anything. Mm -hmm. Like Bishop Finn in 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 Kansas City, Kansas City, who was convicted uh, of conspiracy to cover up after denying he ever he never did it. It it, it just it makes it so hard to, to sift out who's who's really telling the truth and who's not. Um, and that's really sad about this. But in any event, Malone went to see the Pope. Uh, this, this was following a, an apostolic visitation and investigation uh, that went on uh, to look into what was happening in the diocese. And then... Uh, and just to interject something real quick, if I remember correctly, I believe earlier this year, back in maybe around the, the springtime or maybe early, maybe around May, uh, I think even the seminary rector in the diocese of Buffalo stood up to the bishop in some manner and was, I don't, I don't recall if he was disciplined formally or something, but I mean, there was like active mutiny in the diocese. It was, it was very serious. 
yes, seminarians, I think it was either the rector or someone in a position of authority, you're right, um, you know, clearly calling out this, this activity uh, of covering up abuse. And, and again, what's so sad about this is we're like now a score of years, we're took almost 20 years since the first abuse crisis broke, right, right long before McCarrick, talking about around the year 2000. And it's, it's sort of like nothing has changed. It's, it's all the same. Nothing's different. Notwithstanding, you know, all these meetings and bureaucracies and policies. And Even the big Vatican summit earlier this year. The big Vatican summit. It's, it's like nothing. It's business as usual. And um, the end of the story uh, really reinforces that point. Um, so <laughs> this bishop, uh, Bishop Edward Scharfenberger, who's the Bishop of Albany, uh, was appointed apostolic administrator. So unlike the case of Donald Wuerl, uh, who uh, got caught, who was involved in the Theodore McCarrick, Mr. Theodore McCarrick, former Correct. Theodore McCarrick scandal, he resigned uh, because he- But then was appointed an apostolic a administrator. Exactly. <laughs> so first he denied any involvement and then, oops, whoops, sorry, actually I was involved. He resigned and then is reappointed apostolic administrator <laughs> by Francis. I mean, it's kind of like, like the embezzler in a company, <laughs> you're like, okay, you're going to be the trustee in bankruptcy. <laughs> uh, but at least in this case, uh, Malone was not appointed administrator. This, this uh, bishop uh, here that you can see, Scharfenberger, uh, was appointed. Uh, so he had a, held a press conference and uh, introduced himself to the Diocese of uh, Buffalo. And I just want to play a very short, less than a minute clip of something he said in this press conference. And, then we'll talk. and uh, that having been said, too, uh, I'm glad that the department heads are here. You know, uh, the work of, uh, I'm appointed as what is called an apostolic administrator. And the work of any administrator, those of us that have read Peter Drucker, know that uh, any, any administrator is only as good as his advisors or her advisors. And that uh, it's so important to have good collaboration. And, uh, and I am encouraging that, you know, particularly cooperation among clergy and laity in the spirit of Vatican II. That's the way I like to manage, consulting with management. But my primary role is... I now, <laughs> we're to eliminate the backdrop, take him out of clerical attire, <laughs> and then ask, is this a bishop or a CEO of some giant bureaucratic corporation. <laughs> I bet most people would pick he. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is how we got to where we are. Bishops are no longer monarchs of their diocese, whose primary, as canon law says, concern is the salvation of souls. They have become bureaucratic managers. And look at who's, I'm so happy that the heads of departments are here. I mean, he even used the term, that's how I like to manage. That's how I like to manage. He referred to Peter Drucker, uh, who is a, a, a German scholar who wrote massive books on business organizations. It's actually interesting from a, from a business perspective, uh, books on management of, of businesses and profit. And, and that he's only as good as his advisors. Well, that gives us great confidence in your leadership abilities, your excellency. Well, exactly, since his advisors are the advisors to this outgoing bishop. <laughs> and, and yet again... We've had, you know, 50 years post-Vatican II of the bureaucratic church, right? The church that's dominated by synodal mentality, bishops' conferences, and, you know, primary concern for the institutions, the temporal institutions, and not for the salvation of souls. And that's what's got us here. And what's his management style? Vatican II. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a broken record. It's like, well, yeah. that's what got us to this person to have to resign you're taking over for. I mean, I almost, uh, it's interesting, this is sort of side note, but I noticed Angelico Press this week announced a reprinting of a, a phenomenal uh, book of fiction uh, called uh, Miter and Crook, for uh -huh. the Brian Hooten. For those who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's a great book. And it's basically a, um, a story where this bishop is appointed, uh, this, this, this bishop, uh, it sort of opens with sort of announcing I've had, mm -hmm. and this is happening in the 70s, shortly after Vatican II in the new mass. He's like, I've had enough. This is a disaster. And he is basically going back to the pre-Vatican II way. Uh, it's an incredible story of kind of what in the diocese in England when one bishop sort of says, 
calls you know the emperor's new clothes for what they are and say this this is not working and and, and really a phenomenal story it's, it's a great great piece of um literature in the in the truest sense that it's fiction but it's one that carries a lot of truths and has thought about the contrast of that bishop and this <laughs> managerial bureaucrat who's now taken over in in buffalo so right uh, Sad, sad example. And I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, he does come off as being, you know, we hope that he is sincerely concerned and is going to give it his best shot, as he says. But unfortunately, you know, when you, St. Thomas says something to the effect of when you, a small error in the beginning leads to big yes. errors in the end. So, yes. unfortunately, if we're starting with bad principles, we can't expect there to be good results. Exactly, exactly. And in a sense, he doesn't start off by saying, you know, violations of the sixth and ninth commandment are gravely sinful, are even more sinful for clerics who, who not only commit the sin, but break a vow. And this ends today. There is no tolerance of this. And we need to stop promoting woolly theology that makes it sound like these aren't a big deal. No, that's not what right. it's <laughs> Right. And the other, just to, before we move on to our next story, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, I think there's definitely a time and a place for, we need they need to be expressing compassion for the victims. But I think what the victims themselves want to see is a holy and righteous anger against the evil and a real zeal to stamp it out no matter what it takes. And that yes. seems to be what's lacking on a lot the part of a lot of these um, bishops who make these, you know, they, they come off as being very compassionate and that's a good thing, but where is the zeal, like where is the hatred of the sin? I think we need to see more of that. Right. Well, and I did mention uh, his secretary, Siobhan O'Connor, who's been, uh, Siobhan, I think it's O'Connor, who's been the, the whistleblower here. She released a statement that LifeSide News reported on um, that said, essentially, although she was, you know, that basically she was happy to see this finally happen, even though it's, quote, overdue. She said, while Bishop Malone's resignation is long overdue, I, will, I am still grateful for it. His continued presence within the Diocese of Buffalo has been a source of increasing frustration and distress for survivors and parishioners alike. And it highlights just sort of a, a, a last point here, that again, the, 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 these, these sort of horrible things have been done, but it, it's the total breakdown of law in the church. So the Pope doesn't doesn't actually try this bishop and punish him. He just has this sort of staged corporate CEO, here's your golden parachute, jump off and you know, you right. jump off into the sunset. Uh, but no real justice here. He just sort of, oh, well, I'm done. I can't do any more. Hand on to the next person rather than being held accountable. And, and justice, there is a part of justice that is retributive justice. When something's done yeah. wrong, someone has to make you know, make up for it. And correct. Um, and and no actually, it, and uh, Bishop Malone released a statement. I can try and include that in, the link to it in the description for this video. But um, he actually says he intends to reside in the the diocese and offers yeah. his services. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief! <laughs> his uh, services. You have a scandal to cover up? Call me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my. So uh, to transition into our next story, I had a, a thought come to mind uh, regarding Vatican II. You know, something we often hear, uh, one of the talking points, you might say, of the council is that the age of the laity has arrived, you know, and that's what this yeah. Bishop Scharfenberger talked about, the, the way that he likes to manage is, what did he say, cooperation between clergy and laity, which obviously a certain amount of that is legitimate and needs to happen but it's not like a democracy a, a collaboration between equals. So anyway, the, the connection with this whole idea of the age of the laity, I think in, in one sense it is coming to that, but not in the sense that they try to make it, that like this egalitarianism, it's really the age of the laity in the sense that similar to during the Arian crisis, uh, John Henry, Cardinal John Henry Newman talked about that the, the faithful by, by and large were, were more faithful to their baptism their baptismal vows than the clergy the, the bishops mm. were and a prime example of that would be our is our next story involving the the brave young man from austria alexander to who organized a 
public rosary outside of a church. Uh, I believe it was in the cathedral. Yeah, it was at the Vienna Cathedral. I, yes, yeah. I yes, it was. Yes, uh, so he organized an event outside the Vienna Cathedral, and the event featured. Uh, I think Brian's going to display a, a photo on the the screen momentarily. Yeah, warning! This is a yeah. disturbing image. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> So this man, and it, it is a man, <laughs> despite the appearance, has a, a female stage persona. He's a, a performing artist, singer, I believe. Uh, artist, I, we usually come <laughs> loose. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> artist with quotes. Uh, so his stage persona name is Conchita Wurst. Uh, I think that's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the, the claim to fame is the, the female singer with a beard. Obviously, this is not a female. It's clearly this is a male we're talking about. But yeah. this person was apparently allowed to perform inside the Cathedral of Vienna. Well, and actually, if you look at this report, performed in the sanctuary. Oh, my. In century yeah. cathedral with so talk male about and right. female adolescents use for backup. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think so it's talk, used, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Talk about the need for prayer, fasting, and reparation that we mentioned earlier. I mean, this is this is complete. It's not unprecedented, but it's nonetheless outrageous. And it was done with the full approval of none other than Cardinal Christoph Schonborn, who is one of the prelates in the church, as we know, is very sympathetic to the whole quote LGBT movement. I'm sure he's a, a big fan of Father James. Uh, Martin and and those kind of folks. So, thankfully, uh, young man, you know Alexander Tushugel, the same one who threw the Pachamama idols into the Tiber River during the Amazon Synod, he organized a a rosary outside the cathedral while this concert, this abomination, was taking place. And thankfully, uh, one of our, one of the few stalwart members of the church's hierarchy, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano issued a public statement of support for uh, the, the public act of reparation and also condemning the event itself. So uh, LifeSite News, uh, Diane Montagna, LifeSite's Rome correspondent, published an article on December 1st for LifeSite with a headline, Archbishop Vigano condemns pro quote LGBT concert in Vienna Cathedral as blasphemous. And certainly, certainly that is the case. So I'll just read a little bit of this uh, to give folks an idea of what transpired. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano has denounced a pro-LGBT concert hosted last night, so that would have been November 30th, in St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, calling it the, quote, yet another homoerotic and blasphemous provocation. In a message to Austrian native Alexander Tushugel, who organized a rosary outside the cathedral while the concert was taking place, Archbishop Vigano said the event represents, quote, the sinister vision of a church that seems to want to rebuild itself against the faith and against the truth of the human person. So I highly encourage viewers, I'll include a link to this article in the description of, the, of this video to go and read the full statement of Archbishop Vigano. We don't have time to, to read the whole thing now, but it's a uh, very edifying reading. It's, it's encouraging to see that at least one member of the hierarchy is willing, you know, the whole hierarchy should be up in arms about this. Pope Francis should be calling Cardinal Schonborn into his office for a, a very uh, <laughs> harsh uh, cor um, correction uh, of this. This is outrageous that he would allow such a thing. Well, but again, unlikely, because another story that emerged this week uh, that, that, that shows this, is, this kind of event is just par for the course in the, in the Church of Bergoglio with the complete breakdown of the moral, the Church's defense of the moral law. So um, this week, uh, the Pope, uh, or not this week, sorry, it was a little before this week, wasn't it? He was in Thailand, uh, but it was released, I think, this week that he answered questions of some Jesuits uh, when he was in Thailand, and this one particular question uh, was reported. Uh, one of the Jesuits there said, we have divorced and remarried Catholics in our communities. How are we to behave 
pastorally with them. And quote, here's the, the Pope Francis's answer. I could answer you in two ways, in a caustic way, <laughs> however, is not Christian, even if it can be ecclesiastical. I, I, first of all, let me just pause. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's not Christian, but it's ecclesiastical. <laughs> Going back. Or, so I can ask, answer you caustically, or according to the magisterium of the church, pause, you would think that he'd say, tell them it's a sin. <laughs> According to the magisterium of the church, going back to Pope Francis, as in the eighth chapter of Amoris Laetitiae, that is, journey, accompany, and discern to find solutions. And this has nothing to do with situation ethics, <laughs> with the great moral tradition of the church. I mean, no wonder why Schoenberg's doing this in his cathedral. Look at the nonsense of that. This is the world we <laughs> say, oh, tell everybody, accompany them, journey them, it's all okay, but that's not situation ethics. That's the moral tradition of the church, when what you've just said is 180 degrees from the moral tradition of the church. Right? The moral right. tradition of the church is adultery is evil. You cannot receive sacraments when in a state of adultery. But for him, magisterium is not the moral tradition of the church. Magisterium is the eighth chapter of Amoris Laetitiae. Right. You know, substitute is now itself the moral tradition of the church. I mean, it has become, he has overturned the moral tradition of the church. So, well, he's seen, I mean, his understanding of magisterium and governance seems to be absolutism, that if I say yes. it, it, it automatically is so. Yes. Yes. It's unbelievable. There, therefore, it is. Right. So, again, everything's connected. That's going to be our message here. <laughs> the Amazon Synod. He's, I mean, even a broken clock is right, what is it, twice a day? Yes, and yes. Is right sometimes. And he is right. Everything is connected. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's why we're seeing this. Absolutely right. So for those who'd like uh, some, a, a firsthand account of what transpired, uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall earlier this week interviewed Alexander Tashugal, and that interview is available on uh, Dr. Marshall's YouTube channel. I'll try to include a link to that in the description for this video so that folks can, can take a look at that. And once again, as we did with the, the Pachamama idol dunking, we applaud Mr. Tashugal and, and hope that he will continue uh, giving these courageous um, public witnesses to the faith and, and inspire his generation to do the same. Great. Well, um, returning to the United States, uh, for several newscasts, we've been reporting, we had reported on the trial of Mr. Deladen uh, and others who exposed the criminal and immoral activity of Planned Parenthood of uh, selling human body parts uh, after following abortions. And as you may recall, uh, Mr. Deladen was ordered to pay two, over $2 million to Planned Parenthood for the heinous offense of actually showing that they were breaking the law. <laughs> the young world we live in. Um, but we do have actually a, a good story to report today. Um, one of the lawyers who represented Mr. Delot and who works for the Thomas More, St. Thomas More uh, Law Center that represents Catholics who are persecuted today, uh, Sarah, and I'm not sure how you say her, I think it's Pitlick. Is that how you I think that's how you pronounce her name. Um, here yeah, she is. Yeah, she uh, was one of the, one of the, again, there were many lawyers, a case this size, but one of the lawyers that represented him. Uh, has been a great pro-life uh, uh, defender, legal defender for a long time. She was confirmed this week by the Senate in a 49 to 44 vote um, to be a federal judge in Missouri, uh, to take a seat as a federal judge. Um, and again, all the things that we could say about President Trump, he, he certainly has not done everything perfectly. We, we certainly have some valid criticisms we could level against him. But one thing we cannot uh, deny is his profound effect on the judiciary. Again, most people focus on the Supreme Court appointments, which he, he has made, but it's projected that by the end of this first term, uh, not even considering the second term, but by the end of this term, he will have appointed a, about almost a third of federal judges. Wow. And uh, again, the Supreme Court is very important, but they only hear a few you know, dozen cases a year. Most of the things that happen that affect people on the ground are in federal district court and in the courts of appeal. Um, that's where so much of this plays out. 
And to have a judge like this, uh, who uh, has been appointed, uh, and she's just representative of, uh, of them, uh, is really phenomenal. And uh, the one great test that lets you know, uh, you know, how good these judges really are and how they really are from a more, he's, again, Trump may not have been the most moral person in his own life, but he seems to be really good at picking judges um, that are, are so attuned to the natural law. Uh, and how do we know she's so good? Because she has been condemned by the Huffington Post. <laughs> what a mark of honor. <laughs> condemned by the, the Huffington Post. And I'll just, this was an article the, that came out when they were going to vote right before uh, Judge, I guess now Pitlick, was being voted on. Um, and they just go after her uh, because uh, she, again, they mentioned she was special counsel of St. Thomas More Society, conservative anti-abortion anti -abortion law firm based in Chicago. Went on to say in a 2017 interview at the National Catholic Register that, quote, surrogacy is harmful to mothers and children. So it's a practice society should not be enforcing. Uh, and again, interesting. Oh, the scandal. <laughs> yeah, the scandal. Uh, you know, not only is she, like, she is so far beyond the pale, not only is she opposed to abortion, but she has spoken out consistently against not just abortion, but to put abortion in its proper context. So again, surrogacy and also looking up here, um, she claimed that fertility treatments such as in vitro fertilization, which always result in the death of fertilized embryos of children, gravely affects our society, including diminished respect for motherhood and the unique mother-child bond, exploitation of women, commodification of gestation and of children themselves, and weakening of appropriate social mores against eugenic abortion. So again, and this should all just be a matter of common sense. I mean, that because that's what it is. This shouldn't be just shouldn't, statements like that should not cause scandal. That should just be well, yeah, of course. If you didn't say that, I'd be concerned. <laughs> exactly, and, and again, for these statements and for the Huffington Post to get so worked up, this is not just a, a lawyer who paid lip service, as, as sometimes happened under the Bush presidencies, to the pro-life movement, and then that sort of bought them a ticket in. I mean, clearly, this this lady. Uh, understands abortion in the broadest context of all of these evils against um, everything is connected again. <laughs> yes, exactly. So again, our we commend President Trump uh, and the Republicans, uh, all of whom, all forty nine of whom were Republicans who voted for her to confirm her and, and wish her uh, success in upholding the moral law on on the federal district court in Missouri. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our show for today. I did want to remind folks quickly before we conclude that today, as I said earlier, is the first Friday of the month. So if you are able to make it to Mass and receive Holy Communion as an act of reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we know that that's something that our Lord has, has asked the faithful to do through St. Margaret Mary Ellicott back in the late uh, 1600s, early 1700s. Tomorrow, of course, is the first Saturday of the month, and we know that our Lady of Fatima asked for the uh, communion of reparations on the five first Saturdays and also um, to go to confession, which you can do either eight days before or after, and also pray five decades of the rosary and spend 15 minutes meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary, all with the intention of making reparation to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart for the five principal blasphemies against her Immaculate Heart, which our Lord mm -hmm mentioned to Sister Lucia. Uh, and act, one of those actually is that we have the feast this coming Sunday of uh, the, Immac the Immaculate Conception. That's one of the five blasphemies against mm -hmm. Our Lady is those who deny her Immaculate Conception. Uh, something else I wanted to mention just this morning uh, before I started getting ready for our to record our show, I was watching uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall had our good friend and colleague Chris Ferrara on his show today, and it's an excellent program. It covers a lot of, uh, I think, some similar themes that we cover on this program. So I encourage viewers to, to go to Dr. Taylor Marshall's um, YouTube channel and, and they can find the link to that broadcast. It was just um, streamed live this morning, so it was a great show. And then as always, we always we just encourage folks to, to subscribe to Catholic Family News. Go to our website, catholicfamilynews.com. 
uh, as Brian often reminds us on the show, you know, it's only through subscriptions to the newspaper. It's primarily through subscriptions to the newspaper that we have the resources necessary to produce this free video content and the other content that we produce on our website and such. We really do need you. So we ask for your, for your continued support and for your prayers. I don't know if Brian has anything further he'd like to add. Definitely. Again, with Christmas coming up, um, you know, maybe you, maybe you already subscribe. You could buy a subscription for a family member or a friend, or call the office. You can buy do sort of a, a, a subscription of a number of copies. It can come in a bundle that you just put out at your chapel, your church. Maybe drive by, drop off at a <laughs> sort of church nearby. You never know who will pick it up. Um, That's right. You know, it's right. uh, it, it's. You never know who you'll reach. So again, you can support us, but also help someone else maybe by by bringing Catholic Family News uh, to to them. Right, and as I said in my uh, my letter to readers in our December edition, which is out now, we really encourage you to be ambassadors for Catholic Family News in your local area to help us spread the word to to give the gift of truth this Christmas, as I put it in my my letter to to our supporters in the paper. So we'll go ahead and close as we usually do with praying a Hail Mary and, and definitely want to offer this in union with the, the fasting, the prayer and reparation that's going on hopefully all over the world today. Uh, and to pray that, that God in his mercy through the intercession of Our Lady and especially of St. Nicholas on his feast day would really bind the devil and his minions and, and drive them out of his church, of his holy temple. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Saint Nicholas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, thank you again for watching, and until next time, have a great week. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.